it's this goal of like, if you ask me, where do I want to be five years from now? I want, I just want to be a better version of myself. Um, and so I'm very proud of who I am today, but I think it, uh, expanding on each of those pillars is going to be essential for me to be a better version of myself. And if I only invest in one of them, I will become out of balance and I will not be a better version of myself. And so long term, the advice is continue to have intentionality and continue to be OK with the idea that it won't ever be perfectly in balance, but you're going to put forth the effort to get yourself back. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, hello and welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm your guest. I'm not your guest. I'm your host today. I have a special guest, uh, but I'm your host, Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And my guest today has only raised about $42 million. Wow. And we got some information to talk about today. We're going to dive deep into how he is going about raising private money. And he has got fantastic experience that he can share with us. Well, he is a prominent multifamily owner, operator, and syndicator. He's a CEO of SNS Capital Group. And check this out under management, assets under management now are right at $200 million. Well, he and his team offer a focused alternative for passive investors in the multifamily space. Now, check this out. If you have been listening to any podcast for any length of time, you know, Bigger Pockets is like the most popular real estate investing uh, podcast out there. And my guest has had multiple appearances on the acclaimed real estate podcast, Bigger Pockets. In just a moment, we'll be right back and you're going to be meeting Jared Sturm right after this. Well, hey, Jared, welcome to the show. Jay, thank you for having me. I, I loved the intro and the enthusiasm. You guys are going to have to send me that sound bite so I can <laughs> use it. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Well, you're certainly welcome. But hey, here's here's the question. Are you the guest or are you the host? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just have a back and forth. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, my lands. I obviously did not get enough sleep last night. But anyway, welcome to the show, Jared. I love your backstory. Of course, on the show today, we're going to talk about, first of all, um, when you started raising money and syndicating and raising money for multifamily, uh, how did you go about it? Uh, what are your favorite ways to attract you know, uh, funding, uh, new, new lenders, if you will. And then we're going to talk about um, your company and the opportunities that you offer. But first of all, I want you to share your story, your journey. I mean, you started out as an apartment maintenance technician. And as young as you look, it couldn't have been that many years ago. And then you transformed and segued into becoming the CEO of a very substantial capital group. Tell us that story. Yeah, well, thanks for giving me the platform to share my story and hopefully it resonates with some of your audience because I think it's a very kind of grassroots, organic, uh, relatable story that many of your audience may be at some phase of where I'm at or maybe ahead. So um, 18 years ago, I started as a maintenance technician for another landlord here in my market, which is Cincinnati, Ohio. So I was the guy, you know, changing the toilets, painting the apartments, hanging the blinds, doing whatever was needed. That was actually during high school. So my high school fortunately had a program where if you had enough credits, you could work full time. I wasn't a good student, but I was good in wood shop. So I kind of said, how am I going to use this skill set and uh, got a job making pretty decent money as a maintenance tech, which then allowed me to buy my first house straight out of high school, which was a six bedroom house that me and my brother bought together and rented out the other rooms to friends. And um, that was 2008 that we were stumbling into the real estate market and just fortunately some really good timing. And so using our skill set in the trades, we were growing a construction company and buying distressed houses. And for the first eight years, we did not raise money from investors. We were just uh, buying distressed assets, forcing, forcing appreciation, stripping the equity, 
and then rolling into another small single family or duplex. And for eight years, we scaled that up to, you know, a bunch of units under our, our own ownership with no investors. And then in 2015, we made the transition to shift into the syndication model. So you were one of the first real estate investors the, to employ the co-living strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was making money off uh, running a frat house, basically. Yep. <laughs> I hear you. Well, you know, all of us investors and entrepreneurs, we have these moments or these experiences along the, along the line that really end up shaping your career. Did you have any pivotal moments or anything happen along the way that really shaped uh, to what you have transformed into today? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that it's all the little things that add up. And so there's, there's pivotal moments throughout every single day. And it's like, how do you, how do you step up to those and how do you, sometimes you don't even realize they're there until they've already passed and did you capture them or not? Um, and so it's kind of how you show up every day that I think is pivotal moments. But so one thing that's like a profound memory in my story is, uh, you got to remember I started in 2008, I was 18 years old. I didn't have a W2 job cause I was self-employed. And so lenders were not that interested in lending to an 18 year old, uh, self-employed person with no experience. So it's a different time in the market. What that meant is the first, um, eight houses that we bought, we had to buy all cash and renovate all cash, which was slow and tedious process, but that's the, the route we went. That took us three years to accumulate those eight houses. And I'll never forget, like you're talking pivotal, pivotal moments. It's a profound moment. Um, three years in, we found a little local bank that gave us a 60% cash out blanket or not yeah, a cash out blanket finance um, on our equity that we had put into these eight houses that we did all cash. And it was, it was a profound moment because it was like, this actually worked, right? Like the check that we got from the loan proceeds was, uh, you know, a healthy six figures and being a 21 year old kid that had really deferred a lot of any income and just kind of delaying gratification over three years. And then seeing that check, the pivotal thing that we did, me and my brother at the time was we did not go out and buy things that a reckless 21 year old would buy. What we did was we went out and bought 10 more houses. And so, um, it, it plays into the rest of our story, which is like a story of delayed gratification, this, a story of compounding interest and com a snowball effect of doing the same thing over and over and being disciplined in that approach. And now we sit at, you know, 1400 units here in Cincinnati, Ohio, all from that maybe one decision to just reinvest and delay that gratification. I love it. I love it. Um, Delayed gratification. I think the first time I saw that in print was in the book that I read when I was in my twenties called the road less traveled. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that part of the story. So when you started raising um, private money and capital uh, and attracted, you know, lenders to invest with you, what were some of the mistakes that you started out and you said, you know, I, I don't think I want to go about it that way. So in other words, lessons learned mistakes on attracting money uh, that you would advise a, a new real estate investor to avoid. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I can't say I, well, let me take a step back. The first eight years we did not raise money. And frankly, I didn't ever think I would. Um, the first eight years I kind of took the, philosophy of, man, we started so young that there's no need, right? We got time on our side. We're just going to let compounding interest play, do its part. It's okay if we go a little bit slower because there's a long enough runway, no, no need to dump the fuel on the fire through raising outside capital. And what shifted my mindset about seven years in, um, so myself and my brother who started the company, we have phenomenal parents, just great parents, always supportive, amazing upbringing. But my mom was a stay at home mom. My dad worked the same in the same corporate job for about 30 years doing bookkeeping, which he did a great job at. But he's the type of person that if you read a financial advice book from 1980, like he did everything right. Right. So worked corporate job, invest in the 401k. And 30 years later, that 401k like had been feed to death and basically hadn't 
produce the results that he was looking for to ultimately have the retirement that he was wanting. And we had found around that like seventh year in our career, we had found a 16 unit multifamily deal that it was clear to us it was going to be a very attractive deal and great returns. And we went to, to our parents and we said, look, we can buy this, but why don't you guys buy it and we'll run it. And in 18 months, we did what we did probably three X what his 401k did in 30 years, which allowed mm. my parents to get the lake house they wanted and have the retirement they wanted and retire. And my mindset kind of shifted around that time. It was like, rather than me just say, oh, I'm young. And so I don't need to raise money and I'll kind of just do the compounding interest effect. I saw it as now this is an opportunity for me to share something that I'm really good at, which is forcing appreciation, running these real estate assets to produce cash flow. And my mindset shifted of like, this is an opportunity for, for me to find fulfillment beyond just like covering my bills and covering my living expenses. And so really saw it as uh, a shift there. But your question was like advice for new um, individuals considering raising capital. I think the the one thing that people miss so much, and maybe it's founded in the experience I had with my parents, I think that people forget that um, individuals, whether their net worth is a million or a billion, they traded time to earn that capital. And so really what you're what you're raising is not capital you're raising the time that they traded for that capital and so going back to my story of my dad like how many years of his life did he exchange to earn that capital and then i would advise the new capital raiser like think about what you're actually raising or borrowing or whatever term you want to put on it and what lengths do we go to as a society to save someone's life for another year another day or whatever that might be and yet we'll raise, you know, hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars from an individual that they might have traded five, 10 years of their life to earn. And we treat it reckless, recklessly as an industry. So I just holding that capital to that same standard that you would hold a portion of a person's life to is good advice for a new capital raiser, because I think we can get a little bit too loose with that. I love the analogy. I love the analogy. Think about what the person that you're borrowing money from had to go through and how long it took. And it really shines a light on how you should really, really take advantage uh, of your, you know, of other people's experience and really look after your, your lenders, not only as, as if it was your own money, but as if it was your parents money. Right. Um, and I, and I love the value, um, the framework that you, that you put around that. Now, one thing that you mentioned a moment ago is that you've gotten really good at managing the assets, uh, that you all have under management. So what would you say? And one way that you, that you grow the values is you, is you have value adding strategies mm -hmm. to the, to these assets. So. Can you dive a little bit into some of the specific strategies, value adding strategies that you implement and how it has made a difference in your portfolio? Yeah, I, I think um, property management and construction are the maybe the least fun, least profitable, most important components of real estate investment. <laughs> so we want full control of that because our our whole investment strategy is to force appreciation. So we're not waiting on the market to give it to us. We're buying an asset that has inefficiencies. We're going to force that ap appreciation. And at a high level, it's going to, for us, come down to property management and or construction. And so as you get beyond those initial components, it's going to be very deal specific, right? So you might be like this one property just needs to go from 1990s finishes to more modern finishes. Or another example would be, you know, recently we bought a 246 unit uh, foreclosure with a hundred of the units vacant when we made the acquisition. So that's a more heavy value add that we're going in and, and pulling those levers to uh, not only renovate, but also, you know, fill the units back up with a quality resident base that produces a good community and attracts quality residents that have a long length of length of stay. So um, it's, it's incredibly impactful on the bottom line. Um, 
that vertical integration and that control of the operations. Makes sense. Makes sense. So how about share with the audience your approach to syndication and really how would you say it benefits both the investors and your firm? Mm -hmm. um, so my approach has always been that we are first and foremost owner operators of multifamily assets here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And secondarily, we are a syndicator. And so let me, let me parse out the distinction here. So there's, there are, there's, this isn't a matter of right or wrong or me pointing fingers, but there are groups who are just excellent at raising capital, right? They are, their sales and marketing is, is phenomenal and they could have raised money for tech. They could have raised money for whatever industrial real estate. They just happen to choose this one niche. Our core competency, what we're good at is, um, operating multifamily assets. We just happen to further that with syndication. You know, why it's advantageous for us is it does give us the economies of scale. And so in hindsight, you know, eight years ago, I thought, oh, we don't need the capital. But in hindsight, it was very advantageous for us to build out that vertical integration. So as of today, we have 64 employees, you know, a whole construction arm of our company, multiple tiers in the org chart, which gives me freedom and flexibility it also gives me efficiencies that makes us very competitive as a as a buyer and um, uh, produces great financial returns you know what's in it for the investors is at a high level we only raise money from limited partners being passive investors and what we've seen is we can produce equal to or better returns than they could in, in an active investment so if they went out and bought a single family home rented it out and we're looking to produce cash flow. A lot of times our returns are beating that because this is what we do full time. And we're just constantly polishing our operations to produce those returns. So the exchange of value is that we get to build the economies of scale and the investor gets to benefit from those that economies of scale passively at a high level. I think that's a, a, a good way to distinguish it, but there's lots of other um, small benefits as well. Right. So when you have an individual that wants to invest in your company, um, what length of time typically are they going to, well, really two questions. What length of time are they typically going to have their investment uh, with you? And secondly, are they investing in like a particular project that you're working on or more of a general fund? So our typical strategy is a 10 year hold. So we're going to buy an asset that needs that, that has that value add component. We're going to go in force appreciation around year two or three. We're going to restructure the debt either through a refinance or a supplemental loan. We're going to strip out the equity that we force to a safe leverage return. Usually what we've become known for is return hundred percent or more of investor capital, but then continue to run that asset for another eight to seven years, producing consistent, predictable cash flow. So it's about, it, it typically is a 10 year model is what we're doing, which is the longer end of a, um, a syndication. But we like, again, our, our investment philosophy is consistent, predictable cash flow, And so we want longer term holds and that leans on our competitive advantage of operations. But you had asked uh, Jay, you asked two part question there. What remind me what the second part was? Yeah. So um, how, how long, right? How long? And secondly, are they investing in a particular project, a particular asset that your company is managing? Mm -hmm. The answer to the second part is yes. So we identify a specific deal. We put that deal under contract. We produce an offering memorandum and then we present that to investors where in that offering memorandum, it will say, here's why we like the deal. Here's the business plan behind it. Here's the debt. Here's how long we're going to own it. And here's how we think we're going to exit it. And here's the projected returns. So we're not doing a fund model. We're not raising capital and then saying, you know, trust us, we'll go do a good job with it. It's going to be specific to one individual asset. Okay. Very good. And so again, you said you were in it, uh, each project typically about 10 years, but did I hear you say for the investor, for the lenders that are investing in the project, you're look, they're looking to get their, um, their principal back within, what did you say within three years or did I misunderstand you? Yeah, we would outline that all in that offering memorandum that we present up front. But um, what 
what we've done really well is force appreciation to make that asset worth more. Then we go back to the lender, usually around year two, maybe year three, depending on how long that repositioning takes. And then we say, you know, hey, this property that we bought for 10 million, it's now worth 20 million. Will you lend us 70% of 20 million? And, you know, Mr. Lender says, yeah, that's a great, or Mr. Bank says, yeah, that's great. I'll lend you, you know, 70% of 20 million. Well, those loan proceeds, when we're you know, stripping out that equity, will allow us to do a return of capital to our investors. A lot of times, because we're good at forcing appreciation, we can return 100% of their initial contribution back, but they continue to have the same ownership percentage in the deal moving forward. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of investors know this as the infinite return model. So when you have no cash in a deal, but you keep getting distributions, obviously your numerator is zero, but your denominator is something. And so, it, it, mathematically, it's an infinite return, right? And so that allows our investors to repeat invest with us, right? If someone comes in, invests a hundred grand with us and we do our job, we put on new debt, we return that hundred grand to them. And then they say, well, when's the next one, right? And so we're very proud that 60% um, of our investors have participated in two or more deals with us. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are churning their capital while continuing to own long-term. Right. I would anticipate you have experienced the same thing that I experienced. And that is after I had just a few uh, private lenders that were uh, loaning money on our deals, the word started to spread pretty quickly. And so I have not actively sought after new private lenders, investors in many years. Uh, because of the referrals that, that we get, you know, just organically and automatically. But when I started out, obviously it wasn't like that. So I'm interested in hearing your story. When you and your brother first started raising capital for your projects, how did you get the word out and how did you go about doing it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, the first eight years we weren't raising capital, but we were building a solid track record. So I, I, did have that advantage. So when the time came when we wanted to raise capital, you know, we already had eight years under our belt and a lot of success and obviously market conditions from 20 or 2008 to 2015 were pr pretty uh, favorable for us. So hard work plus great market conditions were producing really strong results. Over those eight years, you know, we had people reach out and say, you know, hey, we're seeing what you're doing. If you ever raise capital, just let me know. Again, we didn't think we would, but the wise thing we did was at least keep track of those people in case we ever got into a pinch or in case we ever went, you know, we, we started up in 2008, 9, 10. So we remembered what it was like when no one was lending money. So we were keeping track of those names. Um, but I'll give you the story of our very first one. You know, Jay, we, we made the decision. It was a 93 unit apartment community here in Cincinnati, Ohio. We put the deal under contract. We made the decision we were going to syndicate it. I put together the whole offering memorandum. I sent it to one investor and said like, hey, before I send this out to everyone, I'd love to get your feedback. He reviewed it and basically responded and said, if you take half of the equity, I'll take the other half. And we said, great, let's do that. <laughs> um, and so the syndication wasn't very uh, complex on that first one. But then, you know, he had colleagues and peers and word of mouth spread. And so like you just highlighted for yourself, Jay, like our whole marketing strategy for expanding that investor pool has been do a good job and they'll tell each other, right? So we don't have a complex marketing strategy for um, finding new investors. We just produce good results and they do a good job of finding us. I love it. I love it. So uh, a portion of our audience here that's tuning in has got an interest in looking into multifamily space. So what advice would you give to an aspiring real estate investor looking to get into the multifamily space that hasn't even gotten into it at all? Yeah. I think, you know, I get this question a lot and, and I think you have to know what you're good at. Right. So like I was a, a kid that wasn't great in school, but could always had a natural aptitude for the trades and had that, um, experience in construction that I could build off of. And so that was my path. 
but that certainly doesn't mean it's someone else's path. And so you might have someone who's just really great at building relationships, amazing at sales, and like their path should be about leveraging that and and potentially being the capital raiser for uh, you know some some kind of uh, venture, right? Or you might have someone who's just phenomenal at at tech and data and they can run analytics like no other um it's understanding what is your competitive advantage because at the end of the day we all there's a lot of competition in real estate and we're all chasing financial returns how are you going to have a leg up and so understanding the answer to that question i think is the the best starting point which it's going to it's going to be a different answer for every single person yes that reminds me of my father. He's going to be 91 in two months and he's still doing deals. He's in the middle of a 350 new construction, single family house development, halfway built out. When I grow up, I want to be like him, but he's been, uh, he's been known as uh, he's been called the three D man, which stands for dictate, delegate and disappear. And what I learned from him is, you know, as you just said, Jared, know what is it is that you're good at. And what do you enjoy doing and get out of the way and let somebody else do that, all that other stuff. Jared, I got one last question for you. And this is my favorite question that, uh, that I will have asked you in this interview. And I know your background. I know family is very, very important to you. Community is very, very important to you. My guess is the spiritual side of your life is probably important to you as well. And with those things being the case, uh, one question that I get from, uh, and I run, you know, a mastermind group. I'm, in a, I'm a member of, a, of more than one mastermind group myself. And one thing that I hear real estate investors struggling with is how to balance the business life, the personal life, the, you know, all of us entrepreneurs are driven, driven, driven. Well, most of us have shiny object syndrome. And so the question is, how do you balance all those different areas of your life? And what advice would you have for others who would like to get more balance in their life? Yeah, I, I, I like all other entrepreneurs struggle through this, but I think that's kind of the answer, right? Is the willingness to course correct when you get out of balance, because there are absolutely times when you have to go over into one of those pillars or one of those buckets more than would be sustainable, but course correcting and understanding your intention to be correctly balanced will help you get back there. Right? So if you just get stuck in a rut and you're, you're a workaholic and you never spend time with your family or never take care of yourself or never, you know, spend the time to maximize your spiritual life, then like what it's, it's the ability to, have an intention and then get back on track because there is no one that's going to be like, Oh, I, I got the balance. Right. And let me tell you exactly how to do that. That person's probably trying to sell you something. Um, and so there's times when, um, I go further into spending time with my kids and with my family and with my wife. And I say, Oh, the business needs me back. Right. I got to rebalance. And then there's certainly times where I'm too involved in the business. And I say, I need to get back into the family and, all the other pillars of life. And so it's these, um, it's this goal of like, if you ask me, where do I want to be five years from now? I, I just want to be a better version of myself. Um, and so I'm very proud of who I am today, but I think uh, expanding on each of those pillars is going to be essential for me to be a better version of myself. And if I only invest in one of them, I will become out of balance and I will not be a better version of myself. And so long-term the advice is, continue to have intentionality and continue to be okay with the idea that it won't ever be perfectly in balance, but you're going to put forth the effort to get yourself back. Jared, I appreciate you taking your filter off and being uh, transparent and sharing what's really coming from your heart. How can the audience get in touch with you and learn more about uh, the opportunities to invest and to uh, learn more about your world? So, SNS Capital Group is our website. And I think that would be the, the best place to start to get to know us better. And there's certainly on that website options to reach out. And then we'd have our, you know, different social media platforms where we share more about what, what's going on in our world. But uh, the website's a great place to start. And I'd love to connect with anyone that I can be of value to. 
All right. Well, the uh, website and the connections will be in the show notes, but for all of you that are listening, Jared's website is www.snscapitalgroup.com. Again, that's www.snscapitalgroup.com. Jared, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed getting to visit with you. Yeah, Jay, thank you so much. And anyone else who's in the background producing and giving me the platform to share my story, I really thank you for your time and energy. You're certainly welcome. Well, there you have it, my friend. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate you. Uh, if you're listening on one of your uh, favorite podcast platforms, be sure to follow me so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. And if you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.